All right, good morning. Let's get started. Welcome to Applied Day 2017 and the sixth and final session of Applied Day. We really appreciate everybody that's uh, made it and attended our events. And look for these uh, videos to be recorded. Each session has been recorded and we will be broadcasting them uh, out to the group of attendees first and then uh, they will be posted on a later date out to YouTube as well. So. Look for that. If you have any questions, please, as always, reach out to myself or any of our staff, sales reps or technical reps, uh, to get on the list for receiving these videos as well. So, again, uh, David Elliott here. I am the director of business development on the technology side at Applied Engineering, and I'm here today to introduce uh, the next session here, which is Fusion for Everyone. And so Fusion for Everyone, and uh, really want to quickly just touch on that. We're really excited to talk about this topic. Um, Autodesk has invested a lot of money in this product, and it's really the future of uh, not just CAD, CAM, simulation. Um, I can keep going on, data management. It really is a, a one tool to uh, accomplish a lot of different feats in the engineering world. So. We're really excited about this, and I've got some great uh, presenters to talk about it and to kind of guide you down the path of the future of manufacturing. Before I do that, let's talk about the applied pillars. <clears throat> um, these are really the three key principles that we base our company on. Top talent. Uh, we, we certainly feel that we have some of the best uh, employees here working for applied engineering. Uh, if you've been on any of the other sessions, you've heard our, our speakers speak, uh, talk to this point, but we really have, we have full-time engineers on staff. Uh, we've got about 70 mechanical engineers on staff, and those guys are all uh, full-time employees. They are not contractors or uh, temporary workers for our team. So we feel like uh, because they're part of our team and because we're an ESOP company, um, they're employee-owned, employee -owned, and they're all, we feel that like we really have uh, some solid talent working here. Uh, we have the total technology. Autodesk, uh, Applied Engineering has aligned itself with companies like Autodesk, um, Sigma Nest, Solid Cam, just to name a few of the, of the multiple partnerships that we have uh, with, with delivering technology to our customers. Along with, uh, we also provide uh, software development and have uh, both engineers and software engineers on staff to um, create technology for our customer base. And lastly, we like to tell ourselves as being absolutely adaptable. Uh, our company and, uh, and our, our staff here is uh, designed to help fit into your company and be part of your company. Uh, we don't come over to your company and try to uh, push our applied engineering values on you. Uh, we're there to be part of your team uh, no matter what we do. And whether that's training, our engineering services, our IT services, whatever it might be, uh, we want to be a part of your team. So with that said, I want to, uh, and why I'm here, is to introduce our speakers today on the topic of Fusion for Everyone. Uh, we're, I feel real lucky we've got Dan Luby here today. He's a technical specialist with Autodesk, and Jake Bosman, uh, Autodesk Territory Sales Executive um, in the Midwest here. So with that said, I'm going to let Dan Luby take over. Hey guys, Dan Luby here. Uh, I want to thank you all for joining. Um, I think actually what we want to do is make Jake Bosman the presenter. So I'm going to go ahead and pass that over to him. And while he's getting set up, I'll just do a quick introduction of myself. Um, I've been at Autodesk for about two years. I'm one of the manufacturing technical specialists here. And I focus on the Fusion platform, um, but have a lot of previous experience in other uh, systems. Uh, before joining Autodesk two years ago, I was with SolidWorks. And before that, I was actually in industry uh, working for a company in Minneapolis doing um, industrial machinery. Um, you know, I, I've, I've been around the block, I think. I've been using CAD for about 11 years now. Um, I'd say a majority of my experience was in SolidWorks, um, but I've used Inventor, I've used Creo, I've used even AutoCAD um, a while back, and, and now, you know, I'm working with the Fusion platform. So very excited to be here today. Thanks. Great. Thanks, Dan. 
Excuse me. And thanks, Dave, uh, as well. This is Jake Bosman. I am a territory sales executive with Autodesk. I work on the Fusion platform. I, I manage Minnesota and Iowa. And I'm um, looking forward to educating the group a little bit on what Fusion is, um, you know, and giving some background on some successes that customers have had. Um, and then, obviously, spending the majority of the time today um, on a technical demonstration where Dan's going to show you around the software a bit. Um, so first I want to you know, go through the Fusion platform and specifically Fusion 360, um, educate you on that. Um, I'm going to talk about a customer of ours who has weighed in on his use of Fusion 360 as in, uh, let's say, kind of more of a novice user. And also, you know, at the end, we'll talk about um, you know, Fusion 360 pricing if anybody's interested in, in learning about that and then also open it up for question and answer. Um, so the first thing that I want to talk a little bit about is the direction that Autodesk is going uh, with their product innovation platform, Fusion. Um, traditionally, systems have been deployed in an on-premise fashion where you would buy software, you'd install it on your, on your server, and then you know, access it via a client. Well, over the last 20, 25 years, that's began to evolve. And you know, systems like accounting solutions um, like NetSuite or sales solutions like Salesforce.com or human capital management solutions like Workday have evolved into offering a cloud-based solution. But what's actually lagged behind is product development cloud-based solutions. So Autodesk is actually very unique in that we're the only company that is actively investing in developing a full product innovation platform where you can manage your product development process from not only design but configuration, um, managing the, the machining or 3D printing of that, and also managing the, the insight that you get from those products out in the field. Um, and then part of this tool, as you can kind of see the four modules of, of Fusion, Fusion 360, Fusion Configure, Fusion Lifecycle, Fusion Connect, Part of this tool is Fusion 360, which is an all-in-one CAD, CAM, CIE simulator um, rendering tool that Autodesk is invested in that also allows you to manage some of the product design data. Um, another interesting part of this solution is product lifecycle management. We're uniquely actually offering a cloud-based PLM tool to manage all of the different people from across your company that might interact around a product, whether that's a change to a product um, controlling revisions, you know, giving, let's say, supply chain access to development information. If something were to change in your bomb, they would have access to that to communicate better with vendors, et cetera. Um, so a lot of great things happening with this tool. But today we're going to talk about Fusion 360. And what Fusion 360 is is 3D CAD reinvented. Um, what we did is we basically looked at the market and said, look, current CAD solutions are fragmented, expensive, usually disconnected, kind of limiting, um, you know, where you're installing it on a desktop and, and having to access it via that, usually only PCs. Let's face it, there's a lot of things in the process of using CAD and CAM that take a lot of time. And so we wanted to address that. So I'll kind of go through these three pillars of integrated, connected, and accessible today before we head into a demonstration. So first of all, what we built is an integrated product development platform with 3D for, Fusion 360, where we've taken technologies that have traditionally been separate tools. For instance, for Form, you know, you're using traditional CAD tools like SolidWorks or Creo or Inventor. Um, but we've also built in uh, not only the, the modeling capabilities, sculpting, finishing, scan data, rapid iteration, and rendering, but also function tools. So for simulation, FDA analysis, you know, testing for motion or fit, and also creating animations around how products can be put together or, or taken apart. Um, and then also we've included on the same design and the same tool, um, you can actually build out tool paths or 3D print directly from Fusion 360. So it's really streamlined, let's say, even the prototyping process for companies. Um, and, and I think one of the coolest aspects of it is managing that data. Um, built into Fusion is a design management capability for collaborating across teams on designs. And that's kind of the next pillar, right? Connecting teams. The challenges we see with people is people have a hard time communicating around a design and the changes that need to take place, not only internally, but also with their customers. And customers are demanding to be more involved in the design process. So this tool really enables 
um, you know, teams that are working with customers or vendors to interact around the design and get some get some real time kind of looks at what that design is is doing and get feedback from the customers. And finally. Um, Fusion 360 is unique that it's licensed to you. It's not licensed to your computer. So username and password, and it works on Mac, PC, tablets, phone. Um, you can have online and offline data access, actually. Um, a very short learning curve. Um, we have people pick up Fusion that are traditional SolidWorks or Creo or Inventor users and, and move very quickly in it. Um, so we want to change the way that CAD is used. We want to be able to, to pick up a design on your smartphone when you're on the road and take a look at it, review it, and improve it. Um, here's, a, here's a story about a, a, a user of ours named Eddie Eaton, who's actually one of the first commercial SOLIDWORKS users. He has over 30,000 hours in SOLIDWORKS, and you can actually Google him. He's kind of SOLIDWORKS and CAD famous, if you will. And um, he, you know, he's spoken at SOLIDWORKS World. He also does pr presentations at Autodesk University. He's very versed in, in the design tools that are out there. And he, um, started hearing about Fusion 360, got really interested in it, and decided he was going to use it on a project with uh, within his company um, in Chicago called the Monty Group. So, you know, the first thing that he noticed about Fusion um, was that it was easy to use. You know, he could complete things over, you know, a course of time. He doesn't believe in testing CAD solutions. He believes in, in using them on projects. And as a novice, he was able to complete this specific project where they were adding a you know, extension to a, a bar hockey skate for a, a, a student that had one leg shorter than the other and wanted to play hockey. So he, you know, he did this project with Fusion 360 and, you know, really enjoyed the transition between the CAD systems and bringing in data from other systems like SolidWorks, you know, taking 3D scan data and using that in Fusion and then molding the design to, to work with this particular, um, this particular skate and then also collaborating on this tool with the, the fabricator and creating the tool paths within Fusion. And this is kind of some visuals of what he did. So they basically, they, they built off some 3D scan data that they were using. They did some CAD and um, modeling within Fusion 360 and, and made the, you know, the form fit and function, did some testing FEA analysis, kind of virtual prototyping and also then created some physical prototypes and actually fabricated all using Fusion, um, which is really exciting, and they could collaborate around the data. And that's really what the idea behind Fusion is, is connecting the entire development process into one tool um, and collaborating on that data. And so that's what we want to show you a little bit today, and I'll let, I'll let Dan take over. One thing I want to mention, you can see the SOLIDWORKS symbol. You know, it's, it's very conducive. I know there's a lot of companies that have SOLIDWORKS, Inventor, Creo in place, and it's very conducive to interacting and bringing in data from those systems. Um, so I've got the SOLIDWORKS logo up here and interacting with Fusion, but you could also see an Inventor logo or a Creo logo. Um, it, it's very conducive to that. So we're excited to show you the demo. I'll let Dan take over and talk a little bit about what he's going to tell you and show you, and then we can talk a little bit about your questions and answer them. And if you'd like, we'd show you some pricing as well at the end. So, well, Dan, I will pass presentation privileges to you. Sure. Appreciate that. All right. I will show my screen, and then just to double check that it's viewable, looks like it's being shown to everyone. Uh, yep. So what you're looking at right now, this is the Fusion 360 application. And just like Jake mentioned, you know, we're going to be running through some scenarios inside of Fusion 360 that are conducive with other desktop-based CAD products. So for folks using Inventor, using SOLIDWORKS, Creo, um, or really any other 3D CAD system, um, there's a lot of things we can do inside of Fusion 360 to augment some of the things that you may not be able to do inside of your current solution. Um, so what we'll take a look at today is, you know, how do we import data from another system? Uh, what types of data? You know, what types of file formats can we import? And then what, what can we do with them? Uh, so what we'll look at is we'll look at some direct editing, uh, how we can actually manipulate geometry from imported data. We'll take a look at uh, editing mesh files. Um, you know, again, my, my previous experiences in SOLIDWORKS never really had a good experience with scan data. Um, and, you know, that's becoming more and more popular as, you know, scanners become uh, more and more affordable. And I just never really had a good solution inside of SOLIDWORKS. I know we have, like, there was like a scan to 3D capability, but it never really worked 
that well. And so I want to show a little bit about you know what we can do in Fusion with uh, some reverse engineering workflows, and then we'll take a look at conceptual design inside of Fusion. We have many different design methodologies and techniques built into Fusion. There's one that I want to highlight today that you've probably not seen before. Um, it's called subdivisional surface modeling, um, and we, we drive that with a technology called T-splines. Uh, so I want to introduce that to you as well. Uh, and then we'll take a look at some uh, another concept called shape optimization. Uh, for you inventor users out there, you may be familiar uh, with this functionality, um, but this is really kind of the first stages of moving a CAD system towards uh, technology, you know, like generative design, where computers are really doing most of the heavy lifting as we develop and design new geometry. But this is kind of the tip of the iceberg. I want to show you what we can do inside of Fusion. Uh, and then we'll take a look at some of the other workspaces inside of Fusion that may be, you know, different personas within a business, like rendering uh, could be done by a marketing, you know, professional. Uh, we'll take a look at that environment and some of the capabilities there, as well as FEA analysis. Um, and, you know, these will be short examples today because we don't have a ton of time. Uh, and then downstream we'll look at, you know, fabrication. So how do I quickly, I'll put uh, a prototype, maybe using 3D printing from Fusion, um, and, you know, what, what's CAM? I've heard CAMs inside of Fusion. What does that look like? How do you, you know, go ahead and program a part? What does that look like? So we'll go through those things today. Um, and this is the UI uh, that I want to introduce you to. You'll notice it's it's pretty similar uh, to your standard desktop CAD product. Uh, we have kind of a, uh, a graphic space where the design resides, all the geometry that I've created. I have a ribbon at the top with all of my features and functions, you know, sketch tools, extrude, revolve, you know, anything I need really to go ahead and generate, uh, you know, geometry and create things. Up at the top, I have an assembly structure here on the left-hand side, and I have a feature tree at the bottom. So we actually split apart the assembly tree and the feature tree uh, to make it easier for navigation and, uh, you know, while you work, making it more efficient. Now, there's two areas where we start to kind of, we kind of function a little different than your traditional CAD tool. And the first one is the workspace manager. Um, when I click on this model workspace dropdown, it shows me all the various workspaces that I can move to to essentially filter my commands for that given task. So anything above the top line, both model and patch, there's also another sub-environment called sculpt that we'll explore. Those three environments, those are all really uh, for geometry creation, right? So if I need to design something, and depending on the methodology, the design technique you'd like to use, you may be in one workspace or another, but they're all for creating geometry. Uh, below that, we have a render environment. And this is where we really start to get to utilize some of the new technology that's built into the Fusion platform. And that's because it's cloud-based. I can now start to render on the cloud. I don't have to render locally and tie up my machine for an extended period of time. Uh, I have an animation workspace. So if I'd like to you know, demonstrate how my product works or put together assembly or disassembly procedure documentation, um, any image, or excuse me, any animation I create related to my data is actually tied to my CAD file. There's a file relationship there, which is unique to a CAD system. Uh, then we have an FEA workspace. So if you'd like to, you know, uh, simulate dropping something from five feet to see, you know, if it will break when it hits the cement floor, um, if you'd like to run a static uh, stress analysis or check for thermal stresses, um, we have a lot of different options within the simulation workspace, very similar to the rendering workspace where we can start to utilize uh, cloud computing, which is awesome. And then we have a CAM workspace. So Jake talked about, you know, we're trying to open up and enable barriers that have been typically closed between personas within an organization. Think of industrial designers, engineers and drafters, and manufacturing engineers or CNC programmers. Those folks are generally using different tools in the product development process. Here with Infusion, we're trying to make it easy. They all move into one system. They all have their own workspace to do their job, and they're all looking at the exact same data at the same time. Um, and then we do have a drawings workspace. So if you need to continue to create production prints, uh, things like that to be sent out to, you know, contract manufacturers, uh, you have that ability. And you'll notice down here I have sheet metal turned on as well. Uh, so for those of you doing sheet metal design, uh, you do have tools in here for that. Now, I'd say another big area of difference is over here on the left. This is what we call our data panel. All the data I create in Fusion or that I import into Fusion uh, is saved in the cloud, right? Uh, 
this is where I can access it as a Fusion user. And so right now I'm inside of a project that I've created called uh, my SolidWorks project. Uh, I was able to create some folders in here for organization purposes, and then I have some top level components here. And what you'll notice is this one right here says .sldasm. That is the SolidWorks assembly file format. Um, and what I've done is I've uploaded the entire assembly, and what I did then, I just right clicked on this when I was ready, and I said create Fusion design. And what that actually does is it just means, hey, translate this from SOLIDWORKS format into Fusion format, right? So talking a little bit about importing data, I'm going to go to this folder here and I want to show you some of the other file formats that I've also imported into this project called SOLIDWORKS project. So here you're noticing probably more than CAD data or 3D file formats. You're, you're seeing an image file, you're seeing a PDF and a Word document. We can manage any file format you want inside of our cloud PDM system. Um, in, in here, uh, if I kind of just show you a quick demonstration, all of, these, um, all of these projects that I can access inside of Fusion in my data panel are also accessible on the web, right? So if I pull this over here, this is my SolidWorks project, but it's in the browser, and obviously I have to sign in with specific credentials for security purposes to be able to see you know, all the projects that I'm involved in. But you'll notice I see everything that's, uh, that's inside of Fusion over here, right? So if I go into that same import folder, here are all those same files which are accessible in the browser. And if you think about that for a moment, if I can access, you know, access these on my PC in a browser, that means I can access them anywhere and on any device. And so just to kind of show you a demonstration here, I have this SOLIDWORKS part file. I'm just going to drag and drop this into my project folder. And that is uploading my data to the cloud. That file is now inside of my PDM system. And you'll see it's uploading. It gives me a nice little progress bar. And what you'll see in Fusion actually is it actually says, hey, data in this folder has been updated. And if I go back and hit the refresh button inside of Fusion, boom, there is my new SOLIDWORKS part file that's accessible now. Uh, if I want to right click, I can translate this into Fusion format at any given moment. And then I can start to use some direct editing tools. So that's, that's what I did here. This is a gear housing step file. When I right clicked and said create Fusion design, it created this Fusion file format. Notice that when you do that translation, it still maintains the native file format. Right here I get a little notification that this file is ready for viewing in the cloud, which is great. But I'm going to come into this environment now. This is my SOLIDWORKS part file, and what I want to kind of showcase here, I'm going to hide my data panel to get some more real estate. I want to show some of the capabilities of direct editing. And, you know, I'll be performing those on a step file that was translated, but this could be any file format that's been translated. As long as it's in Fusion format, I now have the ability to do direct editing capabilities. So something like just grabbing these surfaces here, I don't know what this data even means. I can just, I can just highlight faces and delete them, right? If I want to change uh, maybe the diameter of these holes, I have this press pull command. And when I choose some formats here, you'll notice it gives me the diameter. And I may want to change that to, uh, let's just go a little smaller. Let's go to 175. There we go. And I can start to like manipulate uh, shapes and sizes within this design. Uh, patching tools. I can just highlight faces I don't want anymore. So you imagine this gear housing, uh, you know, maybe there's a motor below these ribs. Uh, it's producing a lot of heat. And I don't need both of these ribs. I can just highlight the faces I don't want. And then I can move faces into the appropriate place. So here, let me come down and choose faces here, not bodies. And I'm just going to grab these two faces, and I'm going to pivot these around a given axis over here. So I'll set my pivot, and now I can rotate this rib to the center, right? So I'll go to about 25 degrees and say, okay. And the system brings the appropriate fillet faces with it and then repatches all surfaces appropriately. You know, things like these weird fillets in here, you know, I don't maybe need these because uh, they're kind of goofy. I can just highlight features like this and just hit delete and remove them from my model. Um, something like this application here, right? Like, let's just grab the move copy command and I'm gonna just grab this whole body here and I'm gonna move this guy forward 
you know, five millimeters. So I can take an entire feature and its faces and move it to a specific direction. Same thing here. I'll grab this face and pull this out. It knows to bring that fillet feature with it. And if you notice here, if I get a little closer, it's giving me a dimension from the face's original location. Um, but what if I don't know that value? Well, I can re-anchor to an existing face and then specify a value from that face. I want it to be 60 millimeters from there. So, you know, in terms of direct editing capabilities, you have a lot of options um, inside of the direct editing environment. Um, there's actually many more things I could do, but for time purposes, we're going to kind of speed up here and move ahead. So, uh, you know, I talked a little bit about mesh data. Um, I want to bring in uh, this drill clean. This is kind of like, it kind of looks like a hair dryer. Uh, it was an OBJ file. So if you've ever scanned something, you get a mesh file format. Typically it's like STL or OBJ. Um, you know, we've brought that in. I've imported that. I have the same right click, create fusion design. And when I open up my scanned drill, we'll take a quick look at here. You'll notice it looks a little different. Right, and it's because it's tessellated faces. Um, each of these are essentially faces that were built from the actual scanner. You'll notice I have kind of a gap in my mesh here. It's not a solid body or a watertight component. Um, but what I want to kind of show you is I now, in the direct editing environment, can see some of my other uh, sub workspaces. So here's my sculpt. Here's my mesh. Um, the reason I see these now is because I have no timeline at the bottom down here, right? Which is pretty normal. If you're gonna import data from another system into Fusion, you're most likely going to be doing direct editing, right? But let's say you don't want to do direct editing. Well, Fusion is flexible and you can choose whether or not to be in a parametric environment or a direct editing environment. Now. More often than not, again, when you import data, you probably don't need to capture design history because you're making minor changes. But if you choose to, you can turn on the parametric timeline and start to capture the movements and features uh, that you do to edit your files uh, in this space. So what I'm going to do is just move down into the mesh environment. And you'll notice that my, my commands change. Imagine each of these workspaces is really just a filter for the commands within the system. So in here, I have a lot of different options for scan data, right? I have the ability to remesh or reduce uh, the number of faces within the mesh. So if I have, you know, super high complexity mesh and I need to reduce it, maybe the um, uh, there's too much uh, going on and you just like need to minimize the faces, you have that option. Um, if I wanna make a closed mesh, uh, it'll actually take this entire body, find holes, patch them appropriately, and close this thing off. I have the ability to erase and fill uh, certain areas. I can smooth out things, and I can do something like a plane cut. So let me turn on my origin here, and I'm just going to grab a plane to kind of make my cut with. We'll bring this out here. I'll look at this directly on. Something like that, plain mesh body that I want to cut here. Oops, we'll pull this out a little bit further. We got this little gap after this little kind of downstream. Let's say I don't need that. I can choose here. Now, how do I want this thing to be filled? I'm going to say no fill for the time being, and I'm just going to say okay, and I've now cut that mesh data, right? So not, not I would say you can't do everything that you could traditionally do with a solid body, but just the ability to manipulate a little bit and treat your mesh data as kind of a first-class CAD citizen, if you will, um, that, that's kind of the power of this environment. So I'm going to go ahead and kind of close off these surfaces. So I did make closed mesh. And I do have options for choosing, you know, how do I want this mesh uh, to be created? I could have uh, decreased the uh, dissemination of the faces. It would have produced, you know, much larger um, uh, tessellated faces, if you will. But the idea here is that I was able to kind of close off this model, um, and I can now use this uh, in inside of a, an assembly environment if I choose to. Now, some of the other areas, you'll notice I have a body here uh, that it created during that last operation. I do have my original, if I ever need to go back and see that mesh file. But notice this, I can convert this uh, to what we call T-spline data. So notice this convert type. I can go from B-Rep face, which is just a solid body face, 
uh, to T-splines, T-splines to B-rep, or I can go from quad mesh to T-splines. Now, one issue here is I have a three-sided mesh. I do not have quad faces in my mesh, um, but we have ways of importing quad data uh, from another free tool at Autodesk called Remake that can then be downstream transformed into a solid body. Um, but in the meantime, if I don't have a quad mesh, that's okay because I can move into the model, or excuse me, I'll move into the sculpt workspace, and I can start to use the subdivisional surface modeling technique. I'm going to start with a cylinder here, and I'm just going to draw kind of a cylinder, and I want to show you this tool called uh, Pull. So I'm just going to leave this as is. I'm going to highlight this surface here, look at this from the side, and I'm just going to pull this body down here, and I'm going to kind of, kind of bring this guy down to this handle here, just so he's like completely wrapped around this handle. Um, this is a surface body and it's in cylinder format. We'll take a look at this here in a little bit uh, in more depth. But what I wanted to show you is that even with your mesh data, it's recognizable uh, by the system. So I can come down here and use this pull command and watch what happens when I choose a T-spline vertex. It snaps to the closest face of my mesh file, right? So imagine what would happen here if I repeat that command and I just grab all of these, notice what it just did. It created a surface that is trying to wrap itself around the shape of this handle and it's getting pretty close. And once it's there, I'm going to turn this mesh data on unselectable so I can just select my T-spline face. But watch what I can do here. I can come in here and grab a face and edge or a vertice and when I do, I now have a manipulator for kind of pulling this guy out. So I'm going to pull this surface out on top of that mesh data where I see fit, right? So maybe this here, um, I want both of these sides to be pulled out at the same time. So what I might do is just turn symmetry on my surface so that if I pull out one side here, you'll see it pulls out both sides, right? So I can start to manipulate this shape. I'll pull out this edge here. Um, let's pull this guy out just a little bit like that. And this is looking pretty good. Now what I may do is I may turn this off for a moment and I may try to crease some edges here. So I'm going to come and grab my crease command. Oops, I had the wrong face selected. I'm going to grab my crease command and I'm going to take this face, this face, and this face. And notice what I just did here is I just creased these edges and I can now grab this point and I can now drag this guy out to kind of soften that surface if you will. And this is looking good, right? This is, I mean, when you do reverse engineering, the goal is to take that scan and make it usable for some reason. And so because I have this T-spline technology built inside of Fusion, I can now take this T-spline body and I can convert this. Right, so T-splines to B-rep face, I can say okay. This creates now just a traditional surface. So the stuff that you've done inside of Inventor and SolidWorks and Creo, when you take a sketch and you loft it to another sketch and then you capture you know, the, the curvature of that catch with guide rails or guidelines, that's the same kind of surface that I just created from my T-spline body. And once I have that, I can move into the sculpt environment and I can use tools uh, like Thicken. Right? So if I want to take and just thicken this entire model here and say, hey, let's make this surface um, five millimeters thick, we'll allow this thing to solve here, I now have a solid body as soon as I accept and allow this thing to be built. So here we go. I have the beginning of my design all from you know scanned data uh, that was very easy to create. So there we go. That's how we can manipulate scan data. Again, if you're interested in learning more about quad OBJ uh, scan data, please let me know. Uh, I am more than willing to walk you through that. Um, it's it's quite, quite awesome how easy that workflow is if you have quad mesh data. Um, okay, so direct editing, uh, check, we've done that. We took a look at some mesh editing. Let's talk a little bit about, uh, let's talk a little more about these, this T-spline technology. Um, I'm going to move back into my main design here, which is, um, I'm sure some of you uh, have seen this design before. This is kind of the jaws of life. Uh, this was a SOLIDWORKS 
uh, assembly that I brought in. And what we may want to do in this environment is use T-splines to start helping us conceptualize a more attractive uh, throttle for this thing. I mean, we have a handle on the back end here, but maybe I want to make it look uh, a little nicer, add a little more curvature, some you know, place for the user's fingers to go. Um, I'm going to use T-splines to kind of demonstrate how quickly we can conceptualize and ideate uh, various options for the rest of the team. So what I'm going to do here is uh, let's take this selection set. Um, actually, this is our hydraulics control assembly. I'm going to just turn this off for the time being. And what I may do is I'm going to move into the sculpt environment by entering and creating a form. You'll notice it kind of makes everything else a little more transparent. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to insert an image to use as a reference for my actual design. So I'm going to move into my desktop and I'm going to grab this image of a grip that I want to kind of model uh, within this environment. So I'm going to kind of scale this guy up a little bit, uh, maybe flip this guy around so it looks a little better, and um, just kind of facilitate and put this thing where I believe I want it. I'm going to turn down the opacity to about 30 and allow geometry to display through this thing. So we're just going to get close to where we want it. We'll kind of scale this guy up, uh, maybe a little bit further than there, something like that. Kind of match the curvature of our design there. Uh, this looks okay for the time being, just an example. Okay, so I have this in my design. Now, in the sculpt environment, you saw me use a cylinder beforehand, but notice I can start with generic shapes within this environment. I can even start with sketches, and I can extrude a subdivided surface. And all that means is it's like a traditional surface, but it's been subdivided into a number of faces, uh, vertices, and edges. And, and so I can choose any of those at any time, and I can start to manipulate those. I'm going to choose cylinder here. I'm going to grab my origin here, and I'm just going to kind of build out uh, a circle that's roughly the shape that I want, and I'm going to just kind of pull this guy back a little bit this way, and uh, I don't need this many faces here, so notice when I grab this, I can remove the number of faces, or I can add a number of faces. I'm going to say OK here, and then what I'm going to do is just double click to grab that entire body, and I'm going to move it over to kind of that starting place if you will, and I actually might even move this down a tiny bit just to kind of capture where I was. Now, like I mentioned before, if I want to apply symmetry to this thing, it's pretty easy. I just grab two equal and opposite faces, and it puts green lines in uh, to allow me to manipulate this shape. So if I grab, again, just this edge here, and I pull this guy out, notice what it does is it pulls out the opposing side as well. Um, same thing. If I double click an edge, I can now scale this thing in 3D. So I'm going to choose this middle point here, and I'm going to bring this guy down, and I'm going to scale it to kind of the place that I want it to be. And then I'm going to grab this edge here, and I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to kind of scale this guy down, just getting close to where I want. I'm going to kind of follow the top edge to begin with, and then we'll manipulate the bottom afterwards. Now check this out. If I hold down the Alt key and I pull out, on one of my manipulators, it actually extrudes an additional face. And I can now kind of pull this guy down a little bit. You just imagine each of these edges are splines, because that's exactly what they are. These are just spline edges. And I can now start to kind of bring this guy up a little bit. Let's pull out another. Let's bring him up and kind of match that top surface here. I'll kind of bring one more out. We'll kind of start to bring this uh, curvature down to the edge here. What I might do now is it may make sense to oops it may make sense to start rotating a face. So if I want, I can just take this face and start to rotate this down. I can continue to do my scaling. And then instead of using the uh, X, Y, and Z, I'm going to just use a plane and I'm going to extrude an additional surface down here. We'll do one more, and then what we'll do here is we'll just kind of wrap this guy up. Uh, Right there, at kind of that zero point. There we go, zero degrees. Okay, now, just like I said, I can take any of these edges at any time. I can take a vertex, and I can start to match, you know, edges based on what it is that I'm trying to do. So let's just grab a number of these edges here. Oops, not that face, just this edge. And I want to pull this up a little bit. That's looking good. I'm going to pull this, just this point straight down a little bit. I'm going to come in here and maybe grab... Let's grab just this edge and pull this guy up to kind of match there. 
I like this, but we're, we're getting close, right? Maybe I'll just grab both and pull those up. There we go. So I've now basically created handle number one, and this may be like my very first design. But what if I need to iterate and show folks on my team uh, some other options, right? Well, I can just highlight this. I can quickly paste a new copy of this, right? We'll say okay there. I'm going to do the same thing one more time, and I'm going to pull this guy down. And I just made now three surface bodies, and I can use this edit form command to start to manipulate this in any way I see fit. So I'm going to turn off my canvas here, and what I may do is let's take a look at, um, let's start to thin this one out at the top, right? So I'm just going to grab um, all of these surfaces here. Actually, I may want to grab including that, and I'm going to use like a scaling tool to make these all thinner in both directions, right? Just just that X and Y direction. Um, maybe the one on the bottom, maybe I don't like these faces here. Uh, notice if I go from left to right, I'll actually select more faces. I'm just going to grab these faces down here. I don't like those. What I may do is I actually want to kind of scale this thing differently. I'm going to rotate this, and then I'm going to extrude some additional faces up this direction and then scale them in to kind of make it a little more flared. I may even want to insert edges to create a grip on this one. So if I want, I can highlight an edge here and I can say insert edge. Um, I'll do that on both sides. So I have a little more, uh, you know, I have more control over this design. And then what I can do is let's kind of like pull this guy over a little bit. And then what I want to do here is I want to pull up just this edge and not that point. Oh, Got to get in there. There we go. Just those two edges. I want to pull this in to to apply some more grips for like the actual fingers of the the users of my design. So I'm going to kind of pull this guy up and in a little bit. And there we go. I'm like able to iterate and create multiple designs very quickly. You know, let's grab these here and let's kind of thin these out in this direction as well something a little more straight. So very flexible, right? T-splines, um, when you need to iterate a design, very easy to do that. Now another thing Jake talked about is collaboration. When I finish that freeform shape, what I'm left with are three surface bodies. Just like the mesh file, I could thicken these surfaces to start generating the shape of my finished handle. But more importantly, what if I want to get some feedback from my team? Well, I have a comments pane inside of Fusion. I can actually come in here and say, hey, Jake Bosman, you know, which handle do you like the best? And I'll even, let's just capture an image that's on my screen. It takes a quick screenshot. I can post this out. And what happens now is Jake gets an email notification asking him, hey, you know, which one of these do you like? And so to be very brief and quick, I'm going to refresh my um, my online uh, PDM system here. I'm going to go back into the top level of my project, and notice it shows, hey, this is in use by Dan. That's okay. I'm, I'm pretending I'm Jake at this moment, by the way. Um, I'm going to click on that file because I recently got a notification uh, asking me, you know, which handle do I like the best? All those comments between the Fusion user and the folks that can access a project on their iPad or wherever, um, those are dynamic. So you're noticing here, here is that comment that I would, you know, that was just made between me and Jake. Um, I'm sure the, uh, the image file is still being completed here. Let's see here. I want to be able to jump into that same project. So here are all my projects. I have a lot. <laughs> Let's go back into that spreader. Hey, Dan, I'm going to make a comment on your design. Yeah. yeah. Send it back to you. Absolutely. Yeah, but the point here is I was able to, to work inside of the Fusion application with existing data, right, with the T-spline technology, with the mesh data, with the imported step file. If I ever need to get feedback from, you know, my team about anything that I've been doing in there, um, I have the ability to make comments, both as the Fusion user and as a non-Fusion user. 
Um, you can actually invite folks into projects that do not have Fusion 360, and they can access the data via the browser, which is exactly what I'm doing here. So what you're noticing here is that same design, right? Jake may come into this environment. He may take a look at, you know, the three handle shapes that I've put in place within this design, and then he has the ability to mark up and comment back to me on this design. So if I open up that comments pane, here are all those same comments that were just made. Uh, Jake may say, hey, you know, this top one's the best, and he hits save. That now is a new comment that is in that thread. And as a Fusion user, I would get the pop-up notifying me, hey, Jake has responded to your comment. Oh, and he did. Check this out. I said, Jake Bosman, which one do you like best? He actually responded to the appropriate. He said, I like the one on the bottom. I'm sitting with a customer. They like the bottom one too. Cool. So, I mean, now I know what to move forward with to continue working on uh, within this design. Another thing you have the ability to do is something called live review. Um, so if you've ever had to do like a, um, like a working session where everyone needs to see kind of a conceptual model, live review works with any CAD file format. So as long as you've uploaded it into um, the, the Fusion application into a project folder, you can invite a number of people into a live collaborative session where you are looking and rotating the exact same model at the exact same time. Uh, this live review session can be initiated from the browser or it can be initiated directly from within Fusion. And if you initiate it from the actual application, you can make changes on the fly and other folks that are reviewing the model with you can see those changes live. So imagine it's like a built-in uh, kind of screen share capability within the system, which is great. Okay, so I'm gonna hide that body here. I'm gonna go back and kind of turn on the remaining components here. And I wanna talk a little bit about, let's turn on the hydraulic assembly. I wanna talk a little bit about um, yeah, simulation, right? Um, you know, how do we run simulation inside of the Fusion environment? Again, anything that I've imported, I now have the ability to, to move and run simulation designs on. So what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna actually find uh, my yoke within my tree or my eye bracket, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna Oh, whoops, let's do this. I'm gonna isolate this guy so everything else is hidden. And we're gonna run some simulation on this. We're also gonna do a few things with it just to kind of get you familiar with what the simulation environment looks like. So as soon as you move into the simulation workspace, you're prompted with, hey, what new study do you want to create? It gives you a little definition as to what you know each of these things do. I wanna show you something called shape optimization. Shape optimization is the ability to specify real world condition and allow the computer to remove weight from that design for you. Um, so here it's asking, hey, what's your target uh, for the shape optimization? I'm gonna specify this design here. Uh, study materials, uh, I have steel listed in all of my components here. And what I actually might do is, um, let's do this. Let's, um, let's highlight this and suppress all except the selected. So I'm gonna just, I basically just turned off, I'd show, show it and hid everything else in the design. I'm gonna just suppress everything else so you can see this here. Uh, now if we look at study materials, I should just have one. This thing is made out of steel. I'm gonna specify a constraint just like traditional FEA analysis. I'm gonna hold this thing on the bottom and then just specify that my loads are across those eye holes uh, where those jaws are really pushing on this design. So I'll kind of move, you know, we'll say, um, I'm trying to remember now which way they would be pushing. We'll say out this direction, 90 degrees, and we'll say across those four faces, there's 250 pounds, oop, not 2,500, 250 pounds of force, just to kind of give you an idea of what this thing will look like. Um, so I've done my constraint, my load, just like traditional uh, FEA analysis. Now the only difference here is I have to do something called preserve region. So I'm gonna highlight a, a space here, and I'm gonna basically I'm gonna expand this out to kind of capture my threads within my model, because um, I need those to be able to, uh, you know, thread this thing into where it belongs. Um, and then I'm gonna also create some additional preserve regions around these holes here, uh, because I need these holes in order to attach to those arms that are actually opening up. Um, I'm gonna kind of move this guy down. I'm gonna choose that bottom surface here, uh, this guy right here. Then I'm gonna do that one more time with my right click menu. We'll open this guy up, pull this guy down and have it go as far as that bottom face. So there we go, I am preserving the geometry in these regions. And if I go to my shape optimization criteria, what I'm really targeting is mass. And this will change in the future. I wanna go down to 65% 
of my current mass within this file with that real world load applied to it. And so what I'm going to do is I have a pre-check tells me I'm good to go and I'm going to go ahead and solve. And the cool part is you can choose to solve locally in the simulation environment or you can solve in the cloud. For the time being, um, oh, you know what? Shapes, shape optimization is cloud only. So let's go ahead and, yeah, let's just do this guy in the cloud, specify and hit solve. And we're going to allow this thing to solve while we go do something else. And it's because I'm utilizing cloud computing. So I can exit there. And what's really happening is here's my simulation progress down here in my data panel. Um, I'm going to actually move back into my modeling workspace, and I'm going to turn everything back on. So I'm going to unisolate everything else here so I can see my entire design. Um, let's grab those, that selection set, and turn on the components that are still hidden. Um, let's do show hide. And let's move into the simulation, or excuse me, the rendering environment while that simulation happens. We'll be wrapping up here pretty soon. Oh, I do want to get to CAM real quick. But notice I move into this environment here. I have an entire library of appearances I can choose from. I have the ability to set scenes, apply background imagery, specify lighting. I can apply decals across even complex surfaces. And it does a good job of kind of mapping that ratio around those faces and kind of move that decal to where I want. And the same thing that we can do inside of the simulation environment Actually, let's change this image to be a little more, a little closer and cooler looking. And I'm going to hit render, and I can do the same thing. I can solve this in the cloud. So I'm going to go ahead and hit render, and I'm going to allow this thing to submit to the cloud. I get a little thumbnail down here. Now check this out. Every time I click save on a file, I create a new version of that file. If I were to go make a change to this document, my rendering would not automatically update because this is a static render I'm creating right now. But if I drag this render over here to the left, to this area called Render on Save, every time you click Save and create a new version of your file, like you increase the diameter of a hole, add a new feature, add a new part, and you create a new version, it re-renders those images for you in the appropriate environment with the appropriate lighting and appearances. So quite popular uh, you know, for marketing folks to not have to bother uh, engineers to redo renderings, uh, which is kind of nice. Okay, so I believe my uh, results were completed. Oh, no, it's still running. That's all right. Let's go into the CAM environment. Let's do some CAM stuff. Um, I'm going to actually open up another file, and then we'll kind of wrap up here. Hopefully that analysis gets done before then. Um, this is a generic vice. All I've done is I've taken my SOLIDWORKS part that I want to machine, and I have brought it into uh, this vice environment. We have a whole... Uh, if you look in the project structure and you scroll all the way down in Fusion, we actually have CAM samples, uh, generic tables and vices that you can bring in and use um, as references to, to machine your parts. But it's quite easy in the CAM environment. I'm basically starting with a setup. And it's looking at all of the geometry in this space and it's saying, hey, do you want to machine everything, including the vice? Uh, the reality of it is no, I just want to machine this one part. I specify uh, my orientation of my work coordinate system. So all I would need to do is specify my z-axis is normal to this face. And then what I can do is I can choose a box point as to where my work coordinate system will start. Right? So where do I want to kind of zero out my coordinate system? Upper left is always good for me. And if I want to specify this as a fixture, right? we'll put this in there. Just so the system knows, this is a fixture. Do not run into this when you generate your tool paths. Stock, you can come in and specify a given size. You'll notice I've kind of already specified mine to the appropriate size for this vice. And what I'll do is I'll say OK. And now I can run through with traditional operations for milling, and I can do my 2D and 3D operations. So an example here is I will face this thing. I'm going to move in and select my tool. So I'm just going to say, hey, show me all my face mills. Uh, let's grab this guy here and say OK. It's going to bring this into the environment. Um, and then I can specify the geometry it's going to cut, which I'm going to leave. It's going to cut everything. I can specify heights for that cut. And then passes and linking is where you take your machining expertise and you dictate the generation of a toolpath during a cut and in between operations. 
So this is where you actually start to put in step over thing, you know, step over direction, pass direction, things like that. And then linking is like, how does the tool operate between, you know, the facing operation and then the roughing operation? As soon as I say, okay, this now generates a tool path for me. This is visual programming uh, of your part all in one application inside of Fusion, right? So next thing I want to do is my adaptive clearing. This is a 3D operation, which means it will move down into pockets. And I am going to choose, uh, let's do my bull nose here, just to kind of speed this up. I know we're coming to the end of the hour here. And I'm going to specify, I'm going to allow this thing to just cut everywhere. The only thing I may change is the bottom of the cut, because you'll notice the bottom of my cut here, it would come down and actually hit uh, my fixture. So what I might want to do here is I'm going to say the bottom of my cut is this face right here. And then there may even be a little bit of an offset, let's say 0.05, just to make sure I don't run into that vice. I say, okay, you can see here the adaptive is running. It's generating tool paths and it's cutting everything that it can fit into. So you'll notice it's bypassing the holes because of the size and diameter of the hole. It's intuitive like that. And the coolest part about this is when it's done, I can simulate what's actually being cut. So I'll turn my tool path and stock on so that it's visual and I'll now hit play and you can see this thing run through and actually machine. I get a timeline at the bottom that shows me the current operation. I get info, real time position information as well as operation and then I get overall statistics, right? So overall machining time for this part with the operations I've programmed as well as distance operations and tool changes. Now the cool part about having cam inside of this environment is if a design change occurs. So you probably noticed this little hazard symbol, that component was out of date. So imagine my SolidWorks component was updated, I can actually import a new version of my file into my project folder and when I do, it just updates the version of that component. So watch this arm is on version 4 and now hops to version 6 because changes were made and really it was just an opening of this pocket here when the cam user moves back in here, he knows, hey, these are invalid. All he needs to do is regenerate tool paths, right? So it's an integrated cam solution, helping your engineers uh, communicate quicker with the guys that are doing CNC programming downstream, and then they can recut that component. Okay, let's move back into that. Um, let's just see if this is complete, just because I want to show you what this looks like. Uh, simulation environment here. There we go. All right, so it's looking at load path criticality, and it's moved this now to a target. You'll notice it's actually showing me areas where material needs to stay, but it can still maintain a healthy, uh, a healthy stress uh, with that load that's been applied. So if I kind of pull this down to where it was, it's showing me where that stress resides as that load is applied. So it brings me back to that target. And then what I can do is I can promote this to the actual solid geometry inside of my design. So if I come back to my selection set here and I hide these things, what you'll see now is a mesh file. So imagine we kind of are back to at the beginning when we imported mesh, it just basically meshed that file and I can now use that as a reference uh, to start conceptualizing this design to lightweight it if need be. So that's what I have for today. There are so many other workflows I'd love to show you, but that's kind of all the time we have. So I'll pass this back on over to Jake. Thanks, guys. I'll jump in here. Dave uh, is back on here. Thanks, Dan. That was that was a great presentation. Um, really appreciate it. If there's any questions, uh, feel free to enter them in the chat here. Um, we would we would love to take on any questions you have, um, answer them, and if we can't answer them here today, uh, feel free to email them to myself. D. Elliott at Godash Applied or sales at Godash Applied, and we can make sure you get those questions answered for you in the future here. So, uh, last couple slides I've got here: unlimited training class packages. Uh, this new thing for 2017. Uh, we are offering unlimited training. It's any of our uh, standard training classes. You can attend for 12 months. It's uh, 49.95 per person, and uh, it's a great savings if you're planning on attending three or more classes. So. With that said, uh, the last, sorry, last and final slide is our LinkedIn Inventor User Group. Uh, this is this has gone live here in the last month, and we're really looking for customers and uh, other 
potential inventor users to jump on board with this and uh, leverage each other for answers, questions, and just building overall knowledge of the product. Um, and don't feel like it's limited to inventor. Uh, AutoCAD, Vault um, uh, are always uh, a part of inventor user group questions as well. So with that said, thank you. Uh, make sure that you guys uh, fill out the survey. There's a five quick questions that really helps us for making the apply day more geared towards what you want it to be. Um, and we really appreciate the feedback.